Well, ladies and gentlemen, I got to tell you, I am so very excited to be here today. And I've been looking forward to this presentation since I was invited to come and speak to you. Here we go, year two with the EMS Leadership Summit. And I am very, very happy that you have allowed me to join you on your professional development journey. Today, you know, I'm going to talk to you about the importance and the components of having good organizational success. And that really is going to revolve around good employee engagement. And I'm going to give you five tips that you could use to help accelerate your employee engagement in your organization. Now, here are your objectives. I'm not going to read them. Uh, I'm not going to read them to you. So when we think about our goal of what we're trying to do as leaders, you know, it's really important that we develop the employee engagement strategies that will allow us to have excellent execution. And this really has been the secret to, you know, to reducing turnover, to improving productivity, to improving efficiency. And it equates to great patient care. It equates to a great client experience. It equates to great customer satisfaction. And whether you're calling them patients or whether you're calling them clients or whether you're calling them customers, we have to be able to think that that is the end result that we are trying to get to. I guess the first question I want to ask you is this. As we start to think about good employee engagement, let's lay some foundation here. Okay. So when we think about the true measurement of leadership success, what do we have here? Is it the fact that we can do a line item budget? Do we know that, you know, because I can get the money going through the organization, that that makes me successful as a leader? How about my schedule? You know, I could work a schedule like nobody's business. You know, sometimes we got these call offs and, you know, we forgot to put these people on vacation and now we're short and now we got to figure out who's coming in. And does that make me a great leader? How about resource management? You know, we put those trucks on the street. You know, we put the, you know, the community paramedicine, you know, vehicles on the street and we're able to move them around. Does that, does that make us good leaders? When really, when we think about the definition of leadership, leadership is a verb. It's not a noun. So when we think about the budget and the schedule and the resources, this is management stuff. This isn't leadership stuff. So now when we start to think about the true measurement of leadership success, here's the secret. And this is a recipe, right? It, it really depends on how engaged, satisfied, and productive your workforce is. It's success of the team. So if my team is successful, I am successful as a leader. If my team can't get the job done, then I'm not able to inspire them and motivate them to get the job done. How effective am I as their leader? It's the work that they do. Are they able to get the trucks ready to go out on time? Are they able to deliver the highest quality of patient care or the highest level of customer service? Are they able to interact with the clients and the patients and the customers to give them that feeling that they are there for them? I mean, this is the moment of truth. As soon as our workforce comes into contact with our patients, with our clients, with our customers, that's the moment of truth. They are out of our out of our reign, and we got to hope that they do the right thing. Well, that great book, Hope Isn't a Strategy, tells us that we've got to be able to remember that. We need our employees more than they need us, and that's something that's really important. And if you're taking notes, write that down. You know, Think about this. There's nothing truer than when it comes to poor employee retention. They are leaving our organization to go to another organization. They don't need us. They've got someplace else to go. So we've got to be able to create an environment that they want to stay. We've got to be able to create an environment that they feel that they want to stay. You know, our job as leaders is to inspire, is to motivate, and to get the very best out of the workforce. We have to be able to get the vision and mission of the organization completed. This is what the success would look like. We're going to talk about vision later on in this presentation, and I'm going to tell you that this is the most important component to the success of the organization, and, and you're going to be surprised why. But we need our workforce more than they need us, right? So we go through that hiring process. We've got to bring those resources in. We've got to be able to fill our open spots. 
So we go through the process and we hire and, you know, we put a hiring process together and we look at their skills and experience and we look at their attitudes and we look at their values and we look at their work history and we try to find the, I'm doing the bunny ears now, we try to find the right fit for our organization that that meets that meets our values that they're going to be able to help us reach the vision and help us reach the mission of the organization and then we finally pick those people and we invite them into our organization to help us be successful i want to say that again we invite these people into our organization to help us be successful and then what do we do we give them a orientation you know, we go and say, here's your policies and here's your procedures and here's your protocols and here's your SOG, whatever it is. And maybe we give them some specialized training on pieces of equipment, cardiac monitors and, and computers and, and, you know, this diagnostic, uh, you know, this diagnostic piece of equipment. And then when that's all over, we go ahead and we stick them in a corner. We go ahead and we put them in the corner of the workplace we want them to be in. We put them in and say, if you have a question, raise your hand. But until then, don't start no trouble. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that we have. We have to remember that our employees come to us with a set of skills. Our employees come to us with a set of experience. And if our job is to get the very best out of the workforce so they can help us to become successful, if we fail to grow their set of experience, if we fail to grow their set of skill, we're going to have the same organization today, tomorrow that we have today. And again, this is one of the biggest failures. So what is it that we want? You know, we want to be able to ensure that our employees are satisfied. We want to be able to ensure that we have good employee engagement. And this is going to increase productivity. They're going to become more efficient. They're going to be prideful to do the work that they have to do. When we give them the value and the importance that we have in them, they're going to head they're going to go ahead and equate that to engagement and satisfaction, right? I, I'm engaged. I want to make the organization better. I want to make sure that the organization is seen as the best in the area. I want to be part of a world-class organization. And then they're going to be satisfied in their roles. Oh my gosh, I just love my job. Oh my gosh, I just love coming to work. Here's one of the biggest failures that I had in my career. I measured it this way. If an employee ever said, I hate coming to work, I have failed my organization as a leader. And again, the moment of truth, are they delivering excellent customer, patient, client experience? That's what we want. Just because we want it doesn't mean we're going to get it. You know, we talked about the fit, right? We talked about the skills. We talked about all those things that need to go into the process of making them great employees, right? We hope that they're going to be great employees once we put them on the books, right? We hope that they're going to make, uh, you know, fit into the organization. We hope that they're going to help us, but we can't do that. We can't hope. We're their leaders. We got to be able to grow them. We got to be able to polish them. We got to be able to help them grow so the organization grows. So, this is where employee engagement comes in. And what exactly is employee engagement? And I'm not going to read it to you here. Here's the definitions. And I, I found some good ones that I think and I've been using for a long time. And the one that I really enjoy is that third one. It usually defines of how willing and eager employees are to put forth discretionary effort towards the organization's success. This is this is them taking on the initiative. This is them being engaged in success. This is them drinking the Kool-Aid and them believing that the organization can be successful. I mean, how many times has an employee come up to you and say, I believe in this organization. I want this organization to be the best. I want to do everything I can. I've heard that in my career. I mean, you, 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 everybody out there, you've got to heard an employee say that at some point. They're begging you. They're saying to you, let's make this the best organization. And, and how can I help? 
And this is what we have to be able to look for. I mean, a lot of times, you know, we I talk to companies about their their research and how they're going about to grow their employees. And there's no research. They, they just hope that their people are going to be happy. You know, we think about employee retention, right? And, and this is a big thing. Recruiting and retention is a big thing. Well, they're directly related. If we can't retain employees, it's because they're not happy where they are or they're looking for greener pastures or they're looking for more money or they're looking to be respected more, or they're looking to be valued more, and they're looking for greener pastures to get that done. If we have employees that are leaving us, employees won't want to come and fill their shoes because they're talking. They're talking to their peers. They're talking to the people that are in the career field, and they're saying, this organization just doesn't care about me. And this is the importance of employee engagement. So let's go ahead and take this slide and just sum it up into one definition, okay? I love the discretionary effort, but there's just one more thing that I think we could add to this. And what is employee engagement? Here it is. It's the emotional connection and commitment of the employees that they have to the organization in achieving the organizational goals, in achieving the organizational values. What are we doing here? You know, what is this about? What's our mission? I mean, have you ever heard those questions? And we have to be able to answer those questions. Everybody wants to be able to be part of something bigger than they are. So let's go ahead and start to talk about how we can do that. And when we're able to give them an emotional connection, now that connection drives the organization's success and profits. Do you know, regardless of the career field that you're in, employees who are highly engaged believe that they can change the bottom line in a positive direction for the organization. How about that? How about the workforce thinking about the bottom line of the organization? And I think that that's really important. And, and there are different types of employee engagement, right? Let's go ahead and get into a little bit of the definition of employee engagement. You have the engaged employee, you have the not engaged or disengaged, and then you have the actively disengaged employee. And, and you know, here are the definitions. You know, we know we could probably put faces to these definitions, right? They're motivated, they're inspired, they're passionate about their work, they care about the organization, they really want to be able to make a difference for the organization. They believe in the mission. They're doing everything they can. They're coming in when you need them to come in. They're teaching classes. They're, they're you know, helping to train people. Then we have those disengaged or not engaged people. These are the people who are going through the motions. These are the people who are just coming to, you know, get a paycheck every day. They're not doing bad work, but they're not engaged into this process. They're not inspired into this process. They're going through the motions and they're doing just enough to get by. You know, it's funny. I had a conversation with an employee one time and uh, it was evaluation time and they got a three on their, on a five scale in their evaluation. And they came and they said, why am I, a why did I get a three? I said, well, let's talk about your, you know, who you are as an employee. You come in in the morning, you punch in, you get your, you get your ambulance ready, you run your calls, you clean out your truck and you go home at the end of your shift and you do nothing else. You are an average employee. You are doing exactly what we are paying you to do. And then the people who are fours are coming in and picking up shifts on their days off. They're coming in and training. Then, you know, the, the fives are the people who are picking up shifts and they're coming in and training and they're developing content for the organization. And he left the meeting by saying, you know what? I guess I am an average employee. I guess I am a three. And he left the meeting. But, the, you know, these are people who are just doing the work you know, that we're paying them for. And now you have the actively disengaged employee. And these are the people who are not only going through the motions, but they're unhappy. They're displaying their unhappiness and they're trying to undermine the success of the organization or they're trying to stir the pot with their coworkers. They're silently being subversive to the success of this organization. So when we think about the types of employees that we have, and you could probably, again, put faces to these definitions, right? We now need to be able to think about the importance of how we are categorizing our employees. And you know what? Let, let's put them in a category, right? We can make them high performers. 
We can make them solid or middle performers. And then we can make them low performers. Our job is to take the low performers and move them into middle performers or solid performers. We take our solid performers and we help them grow into high performers. We take our high performers and we re we re-recruit them into the organization to stay. That's going to be the, that's the secret recipe when it comes to developing your organization. And we have to be able to think about that. So if we think about the Gallup organization, Gallup is the expert when it comes to all things uh, employee engagement. And they have a, on their uh, website, they have a running uh, tally, a dashboard that tells you what global employee engagement is, employee satisfaction is. They keep their tabs on this every day on a daily basis, right? They tell us that 29% of our workforce is engaged. 54% of our workforce is disengaged. And then finally, 17% of our workforce is actively disengaged. So look at those numbers, right? It's the 80-20 rule, right? We got a little bit more right now than 20%, but it's the 80-20 rule. And how are we going to now ensure that we're successful as leaders? You know, we talked about the true measurement of leadership success is how engaged, productive, and satisfied our workforce is. And we're not going to be successful unless our workforce is successful. But how are we going to be successful as leaders when almost three quarters of our workforce is disengaged or actively disengaged? We are fighting an uphill battle. We are pushing a bicycle up a hill with a rope. And it's not going to go very far. When we have employees that aren't engaged, we have an increase in 37% of absenteeism. I mean, I've been there. I've been a paramedic on the street that says, you know what, I just don't want to go to work today. I ain't going to work. I'm not sick, but I'm calling in sick, right? I've done it. Why have I done it? Because I don't want to be at work. I don't want to be around the people. I don't want to do the job because I'm not appreciated. I need a mental health day. And also 65% of turnover is based on poor employee engagement. And that's why this is so important. We need to be able to make certain that we can make sure that the vision and mission of the organization is being, you know, is being um, taken into account, right? So when we have poor employee engagement, you know what this equates to within our organization? We have an inventory shrinkage of 28%. It's 28% worse. So when we think about our inventory, you know, they don't care about the inventory. How many, how many of those people in your organization have their own little medical bags that they have in their car? Where do you think they got that inventory from? Or, you know, they're just giving stuff away or they're just, you know, using as much as they want, right? Safety incidents, they're 48% higher. When people aren't paying attention to how they're doing their job and they're just going through their motions, the the product deficits increase by 41%. In the EMS field, let's go ahead and talk about how they're doing patient care. When they're not engaged or they didn't really care about being there, how are they delivering care to patients that need it? Are they following the protocols? Are they doing the steps they need to do when they do their skills? And then when we think about it, this is the most important. Patient, client, customer satisfaction is 22% worse. And then productivity is 21% worse, right? We want them to be productive, but they have to be engaged. They have to be satisfied. They're not going to be satisfied unless they're engaged. They're not going to be productive unless they're satisfied. And then finally, this all equates to profitability of being 22% worse. And, and what does all this come to, right? What does all this mean? Let me give it to you. You know, so we are at a loss of 450 to 550 billion, with a B, dollars a year in loss because of poor employee engagement in the United States. Organizations lose about this amount of money per year. And we've got to be able to change that. And this is how we're going to do it. Oh, all right. We finally got here, right? So tips to increase a highly engaged workforce. And now we need to start thinking about it. I don't want to put the fear in you. I wanted to go ahead and lay the foundation as to what it is. I wanted to go ahead and lay the foundation as to why this was important. Now what I want to do is I want to be able to give you the tips necessary to make sure that we can be successful as leaders. You know, first off, I've been saying this for a long time. 
The days of command and control and leading from a position of authority are over. And to be honest with you, they've been over for a long time. It's just that we haven't caught up to this yet. And we still lead from a position of authority. In today's high-performing teams, employers must take ownership of the performance of their performance and act on their own to improve their capabilities. And remember, we have to grow just like they have to grow. Managers have to become coaches rather than evaluators. They've got to be able to take the employees into consideration. They've got to be able to make certain that they're paying respect to the people that we invited into our organization to help us be successful. Today's leader has to be a coach, has to be a mentor, has to be, you know, help them with development and help them with their knowledge. We have to be able to improve growth, foster innovation, and boost their performance. Our job as leaders is to get the very best out of the workforce. If we can get the best out of the workforce, then we can ensure that we're reaching our vision. We can ensure that we're reaching our mission. We can ensure that our clients and customers and patients receive the best that they can. I keep saying the same thing, but it really is a formula. A plus B equals C kind of thing. And we've got to be able to refine our leadership approach. We have to be able to understand that our role as leaders is to be there for the workforce. It's not for booking a conference room. It's not for doing a budget. It's we have to be able to focus on the workforce. You know, we got we got jobs too, right? I mean, we got responsibilities too. We got to go to meetings. We got to do budgets. We got to worry about the schedule. But what we're forgetting is the only resource in our organization that increases in value. And that's our workforce. We've got to develop and strengthen our human resource strategies. And that's going to be important to their success. You know, when we remain convinced that some of the biggest opportunities for companies improves growth and innovation and performance... It really falls squarely on the leader to make this happen. If you have an organization that has poor employee engagement, whose fault is that? It has to be the leaders that are in charge of that. All right. So, you know, we all want a World Series ring. We all want a Super Bowl ring, but we're not going to get it. But you know what we can get? We can work for a world-class organization. We can work for an organization that sets the standards for others to follow. We can work for an organization that is really something where I talk highly of and I want to represent and I have pride when I wear my uniform. That's what we need to be able to develop people. You know, they want the win. Everybody wants to be part of a winning team. And why can't our organizations be part of that winning team? So when we think about this, a highly engaged workforce, what do we do for them? How do we make them become successful? Well, they want to be challenged by their work. Sometimes work can be humdrum, right? Sometimes work can be ho-hum. Sometimes work can be so redundant, you want to you know, take your eye out with a spoon. But we've got to be able to find ways to challenge people into their work. You know, maybe we can help them. Maybe they can help us develop a program. Maybe they can help us develop some content. Maybe they can help us. What what can we help them? What can we give them to challenge them within their work? We want to be able to tap them as resources. A highly engaged workforce wants to be respected. And this goes to how their leaders lead them, how their managers lead them, how they're talked to. They don't want to be talked down to. They want to be respected. They want to feel like they're part of the team. They want to feel like that they have a place in this organization. And that's everybody, right? We have biases in our organization sometimes where other people are favorites and the other people are kind of looked down on because they don't believe the same thing or we think, you know, we have a preconceived notion about who they are. We've got to treat everybody the same, and it has to be free from bias. We need to be able to have some flexibility within the workplace. You know, we work in a 24-7, 365, you know, day business, and sometimes flexibility in the within the workplace is uh, challenging, right? We got to be able to do the things we got to do to put the resources on the street to make sure that they're going to be successful, or whatever your mission is. But we need to be able to find some flexibility within the workplace for them. And now we need to figure out what that is. What about the opportunity for growth? Well, we have no growth opportunities here. You know, we've got two supervisors. We got one, two managers. We got a chief. You know, where is it that they're going to go? Well, you know what? People are going to leave the organization. 
Give them the opportunity for growth, whether it's within the organization or whether it's outside the organization. Well, wait a minute, Chris. I'm going to teach all these people everything that they need to know about being good leaders or being great paramedics or whatever it is, and they're going to leave me. They're going to be high performers and they're going to go. Well, I got to tell you, I would rather have a high performing employee leave than a mediocre employee stay. So give them the opportunities for growth. Teach them what they want to know. If it's leadership, teach them leadership. If it's to be the best clinical, teach them to be the best clinical. And then as they move on, there are people who are coming behind them that want those same experiences and the same expertise, right? So... And then the last thing is they want leaders who are trustworthy. And what does that mean? Define trustworthy. You know, they want leaders, they want to work for people who know that, that the leaders have the workforce's best interest in mind, the best interest that they can, that that leader is there for them. You know, you see those pictures all the time of the leaders uh, who are leading from the front and the managers who are leading from the back, right? You want to be able to put yourself out front so the workforce knows that your responsibility is the workforce. Again, the success of the organization falls to the people who are doing the work on the front lines. Your job is not any more important than the people who are doing the work, right? And you've got to be able to remember that, you know, I, I'm consulting with a company right now who is a Amazon partner and, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the gray trucks or, you know, whatever color silver trucks you see running around the street with Amazon. Amazon doesn't own those. They're independently owned. And I'm consulting with a company who is a distributor for Amazon products, right? And one of the things that we talk about in our interview process is your job is more important than the president's job. It's true. The president signs your checks every week, but they don't sign the checks. They don't get that money unless you're putting the packages on the porch. And their job is not any more important than your job is. If you don't do your job, they can't do their job. And the success of the organization is based, you know, the foundation of that organization is based on servant leadership. You've got to be able to prove to your workforce that they are the most important component. So, you know, what does this equate to? When you have good employee engagement, 84% believe that they can impact the organization's success. 84% believe that they can impact. You know, 72% believe that they can positively impact customer service, customer service, client service, patient service, whatever you want to call it. And I think that we've got to remember that we have clients now in the community paramedicine realm. We've got customers, if we want to call them customers. And who's our customer? We always ask that question, right? When we're talking about that in interviews, who's our customer? And we're looking for the answer of everybody we come in contact with. We drive $150,000 billboards down the street every day. And we want to put our best foot forward. When you have an engaged workforce, they are telling you that they can positively impact that. And then finally, this one's important. Again, from the Gallup organization, 68% believe that they can positively affect costs. So this is really what good employee engagement is. I gave you a foundation. I told you what poor employee engagement does for an organization. I'm telling you what good employee engagement does, but how do we do it? Let's talk about these five tips. And the first one I think is the most important, ladies and gentlemen, and I've been talking about this for years. Is your company's vision statement stale? It all starts with a solid vision statement. I love when I speak in front of groups, I love to ask this question. And uh, if you're listening at home, go ahead and play at home with me. Go ahead and raise your hand if your organization has a vision statement. And I love to see the leaders who raise their hand. I do, I do. I mean, they're proud of it. And then the next question really kind of chills them a little bit when I say, who can come up here and recite it for me? And those hands go down really fast. And I'm going to ask the question, if your 
the leader and you don't know what the vision statement of the organization is, why does the workforce need to know the vision of the organization? The vision is an important component. What's the purpose of your vision? It sets, you know, it sets the standards of where you want to go. It sets the standards on what you're going to look like when you get there. It it's your it's your, you know, it's your blueprint of what this house looks like when it's finally built. And your vision statement should be something that's developed every, you know, every couple of years, right? Because things are changing. The EMS field that we have today isn't the EMS field we had when I started back in the 80s, is it? I mean, it's changing so much. And, and now it's changing faster that we have to be able to make sure that our visions stay up for it. What's the purpose? It's the blueprint of the success of the organization. This is the picture of who we want to be. Now what do we do? We reach goals, we develop goals to reach the vision. Then we develop plans to reach the goals that reach the vision. And this is where the growth of the organization comes from. And it's all based around who we want to be as an organization. It's all based around who we're going to look like, what we're going to look like when we get there. It's all based around giving the best customer, client, and patient experience that we can. And it all starts with a solid vision. And I want you to do this with me. I want you to go ahead and play this game with me. Go ahead and close your eyes. And I want you to think about a front door. Now I want you to think about a car. When I said think about a door, you didn't see the letters D-O-O-R. You actually pictured a door. Maybe it was your own front door. When I said think about a car... You didn't see the letter C-A-R. You actually pictured a car. Maybe it was your own car. As a, you know, as humans, we are wired to think in pictures. And in the absence of a picture, we have no idea where we're going. We're going to be successful. Well, what does that mean? You need to be able to make certain that the vision of the organization is as tight as it can be. I read a good book one time that said, where there is no vision, the people will perish. Maybe you've read that good book too. And we now need to know that the vision is where we're going. We need to be able to set the vision up of the organization, what success looks like. We need to be able to set the vision up of the organization, what we're going to look like when we get there. And I'm going to tell you this, and, and let me go ahead and go off script here a little bit. And if you're taking notes, write that down. If you're a leader that doesn't know the vision statement of the organization, go to the book where it is and dust it off and open it up and tear it out and throw it away. And now get your leaders to the table and now get your workforce to the table and sit down and say, let's create a new vision for this organization for the next five years. Who are we? Where are we going? And what are we going to look be, what are we looking like when we get there? And then let everybody know what their responsibility is in reaching the vision. And then hold everybody accountable to their responsibilities to reaching the vision. But when we can see where we're going, it's going to be really important. You know, in my last operational role, when I was talking about the vision with the workforce, I said, what's our vision here? Well, we relocate the sick and injured. Well, that's a good vision. But let's go ahead and change it a little bit. Let's go ahead and modify it a little bit. So we got the supervisors to the table. We got members of the workforce to the table. And we developed three vision statements. And basically, and then we let the workforce vote on which one they wanted. And basically, with a whole bunch of flowery, with a whole bunch of flowery words in the middle, you know, it was with three objectives. We want to deliver the highest quality of patient care. We want to be leaders in our community. We want to be role models for our career field. And everything that we did was stepping towards the vision every day. You know, sometimes the workforce would do some bonehead things, right? And then you would bring them in and say, how does this make us role models for our career field? How does this make us leaders in our community? And you've got to be able now to use your vision for movement right? Then you develop goals to reach the vision. How do we become role models for our career field? How do we become leaders in our community? What's the best way to develop the skills and, and knowledge necessary to deliver the highest quality of patient care? The importance of the vision is to help people see the big picture. It's to let them know how they fit into the success of this organization and what their responsibility is. It's no free ride, right? We're inviting these people into our organization to help us be successful. This is what I need you to do to help us be successful. And what am I going to do? 
is I'm going to help you develop the skills and experience necessary and, and get them involved in this planning, right? I talked about it. Ladies and gentlemen, the best piece of advice I can give you right now is if you don't know your vision statement, throw it away and develop a new one and get people involved. You want to get them engaged? Tell them that they're important into the future of this organization and let's develop a new vision and then build a campaign around it. Put it on their badges, put it on banners, put it everywhere. And it says, this is what we're doing and this is how we're going to get there. Next is always communicate the vision. The vision is success of this organization, deliver the highest quality of patient care, be leaders in our community, role models for our career field and put it everywhere. And then it's a constant focus on the vision and the alignment of achieving those goals. You need to be able to make certain that you step towards the success of the vision every day. Does that mean you're going to do it? No, it doesn't. But you know what? The, the mentality, the philosophy is we're going to try. The philosophy is we're going to work every day to reach the goals. And how do we develop the highest quality of patient care? Boom, here's my goals. Now that you have your goals, what are the plans to reach goal number one? Maybe you have one, you know, you have one goal and you have four steps in the plan to reach that goal. And then you continue that process and make sure that it moves forward. And next is we want to develop our people. Developing the people are very, very important because, again, they come to us with a set of skills. They come to us with a set of experience and we've got to polish them. If we do not grow the workforce, our organization is going to look tomorrow like it looks today. It's going to look a month from now what it looks like a month ago. We have to be able to grow them so they can help us grow the organization. It's vital to the organizational success to make certain that the workforce grows. Now, I, I want to throw a little piece on this because one of the things is I'm developing my next webinar after this, and it's going to be how do we develop a leadership development program or building a leadership development program and watch for that webinar. And one of the problems here is it's not only that we have to develop our workforce, but we have to continually develop our leaders as well because they're the ones that are going to work this blueprint, right? They're the coaches on the sideline with the playbook who are calling the plays. And if they're, you know, stagnant, how stagnant is the organization going to be? Next, we need to develop opportunities for their growth and development. And what does that mean? I mean, it could be, you know, articles. It could be podcasts. It could be webinars. It could be, you know, mentorship and just sitting down and talking to people and talking about ways to, for growth and development. Everybody, nobody just wants to be stagnant. Are they going to sit in an ambulance for 20 years? Well, maybe. And I think that's good for the people that want to do that. But they're going to move on someday and they need to have skills to be successful. Promotions versus professional development. People will always say to me, I don't, I don't have a position for them. You know what? It's not about position. It's about professional development. You know, one of the things that I'm doing in this webinar of building leadership development, uh, a leadership development program is that everybody should understand the concept of leadership, regardless of their position. Remember, the definition of leadership is a verb. It's, it's an action. It's what you do. So it doesn't have to be a position. We just need to recognize that everybody in our organization is going to influence somebody, which is the definition of leadership. True definition of leadership is influence. If I can influence somebody, I can lead somebody. And if we're, tr you know, if we're teaching everybody in our organization, regardless of their position, the skills of leadership you know, the, the, you know, the things that we need to do when it comes to developing leadership qualities, communication, conflict resolution, emotional intelligence, servantly, whatever it is, we're going to have a good, strong workforce. And then sometimes it's training and assignments. You know what? I, I, I do have uh, responsibilities as a leader. Can I take somebody off the truck and get them to help me with the, figuring out what the UHU is or get them to help me with figuring out, you know, the next dynamic, you know, the next posting plan? Why can't I teach them that? Why can't I explain that to them? Anybody who wants to learn, you know, the things about the budget, I used to get people involved in the budget process. And this way they weren't asking me, why can't we get new trucks? Well, here, here's what we bring in. Here's what goes out. Here's what we have left. So how do we do that? We've got a plan for it. So help them. But give them some training opportunities. Give them some assignments to do. Get them to sit at the table with you. You know, if you're saying, I don't have time for that, that's a bigger problem. 
And then this is going to develop knowledge and skills and experience over time. And, you know, one of the things when we talk about leadership development, if we can teach leadership to our workforce and if we can give them the skills necessary to fill positions when they come available, we're not having to go outside. Now we know that it's not just a clipboard and keys to say, you know, here it is, you're in charge. Now we know that the people that we're going to with the clipboard and keys have been in our leadership development program for the past year, and we know that they're going to be able to do the job. Maybe our supervisors are going to need time off. Do we have PRN supervisors that they can come in and step in? Of course we do. And we need to make sure everybody can do those things. And this, you know, this, this whole process here is what creates the result and opportunity. So we need to be able to make certain that our people have the skills, the talent, <clears throat> and the ability to do the job that they need to do, but then to help us to become successful. Next, we want to talk about a culture of appreciation. Do we appreciate our workforce? Well, we better. We need to make sure that they understand that they're the most important component to our success. And we need to be able to fo foster this culture of appreciation. And we need to make certain that everybody is treated the same. We need to figure out ways that we can recognize your people and recognize them for whatever. You did a great job yesterday. I used to I used to call people on the phone and say, I just listened to your radio report. It was an amazing radio report. You know, in this company I was telling you about with this uh, Amazon company that I'm working with, we just put these stickers on the trucks that said, um, how am I driving? Call this 1-800 number and let me, you know, drive, you know, let me, let me know how I'm driving. And somebody called on one of the vans to say we're at this intersection and this driver is driving this van as safe as he can they're doing an excellent job i picked up the phone and i called this employee to say hey you know i know you're driving around this area and he's like yeah how do you know i said one i could see you on the gps but that wasn't it i said somebody just called and said you know, you're doing an amazing job driving. And I just want to thank you for doing that because you are representing this organization with great success. And he was like, you're kidding me. I said, no, I'm not kidding you. That's why I'm calling you. He goes, no, that's why you're calling me. I said, I'm calling you to tell you that somebody is just giving you kudos that you're doing a great job. And he was just so happy and he just couldn't believe. And you could hear the inspiration. You could hear the excitement in his voice. I mean, what did that take me? It took me two minutes on the phone just to say, you know, great job with that call. You know, great job with that radio report. You know, great job with, uh, you know, you're representing the organization. And then celebrate accomplishments. You know, we have people that are going over one year now. We're giving them one-year certificates to say, thank you so much for being with the organization for one year. And find something, you know, you know, give them a pin for their one-year anniversary. You know, let them know that, uh, you know, they have uh, six months with not being absent. But celebrate those accomplishments. And what does it mean? Get them their favorite soda. Get them their favorite candy. Have it sitting on the seat of their truck when they come in in the morning and say, thank you for the work that you're doing. What does that cost an organization? Next is promote a culture of teamwork. I got to tell you, man, this is this is my biggest pet peeve when it comes to organizations. And uh, we have different feelings about the workforce, right? We have people that we like. We have people that we are so, you know, we're so, so about. We have people that we just don't like at all. And you got to remember, I mean, just because they are different, just because they have different beliefs, just because doesn't mean they're not part of the team. And it's our job to make certain that they feel like they're part of the team. Their beliefs don't have to be your beliefs. Your beliefs don't have to be their beliefs. But you invited them into the organization to help us be successful. We need to be able to develop the culture of teamwork. And that's going to be very important. Next, say thank you often and do it with sincerity. I want to thank you for being part of this team. I want to thank you for allowing us to be successful. I want to thank you for your professionalism and your dedication. All right, next. We have to be able, one of the biggest detractors to employee engagement is poor performers. And I talked about it before. We have low performers, middle or solid performers, high performers. Our job is to take the low performers, make the middle performers, make the middle performers into high performers, re-recruit our high performers to stay in the organization, right? And this is what we have to look at. But the people who are middle and high performers don't want 
low performers into their org in their organization. And we've got to be able to do that. This is where we need to set good expectations and then hold everybody accountable to the expectations, even the leadership team. One of the things that one of the things that uh, I work on is is two things that I have zero tolerance for. One is poor security of narcotics. You know, we work under the medical director's license and he gives us the ability or she gives us the ability to uh, work under their license and deliver narcotics with their DEA number. And if we are taking those narcotics and we're not securing them, we're not keeping them safe, we're treating them with disregard, you're now putting that medical director's livelihood uh, in question and I have zero tolerance for that. The other thing that I have zero tolerance for is poor patient care. I don't care who the patients are, whether they're white, whether they're black, whether they're brown, whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they have homes, whether they're homeless, whether they smell, it makes no difference. Everybody gets the same care. Now, once you set the expectations, everybody's accountable to the expectations. And one of the things that I did was when you had poor um, uh, you know, respect of your narcotics and you weren't secure in them, you know, you'd get suspended. And if it happened again, we would end our professional relationship. Well, I had a supervisor who was, who did the same thing. Not only is he given the corrective acting the action and the coaching for people who aren't secure in their narcotics, but he did it himself. And we've got to be able to make certain that we're keeping those people, uh, you know, that we're treating everybody the same. Sort the employees into low, middle, and high performers, and then develop plans to help them move to the next level and let them know that this is just part of their coaching. This is the part that we need to help you grow. And sometimes low performers are dangerous to the workplace. They do become toxic. Low performers are usually those actively disengaged people. But we've got to be able to remember our job as leaders is to get the very best out of the workforce. And how are we doing that if we're not helping them grow? We need to be able to offset the middle and high performers. We gotta. We we need to treat everybody the same. We can't have bias in the organization, but that doesn't mean that our middle and high performers aren't given a little bit more, right? We can give them higher raises when raises come. We can give them, you know, they get more points maybe for shift bids or whatever that is. And then it's motivation for the people who are below them to want to get those shifts. You know, this lowers the engagement, morale, and productivity of everybody who's around. So the people who are coming in late all the time or the people who are constantly, you know, sick and then nothing's happening to them. Uh, and you hear that all the time. Well, this person did it. Nothing happened to them. Well, how do you know nothing happened to them? I'm not voicing what I did to them. So we need to be able to uh, ensure that these people who are low engagement, who are, who are lower in engagement, low morale, it lowers productivity. We got to do something about it. And here's the realization, ladies and gentlemen, our job is to get the very best out of the workforce and help them be successful. Sometimes we have to help them be successful somewhere else. And uh, we have to end our professional relationship. And we have to be able to pull that trigger when we need to. We set the expectations. We hold people accountable. If they're not going to be accountable, we coach them. And then we have to end our professional relationship. Here's a secret recipe as we get to the end. We're coming up on the end here. So uh, streamline the workforce and processes. So when you have workforces and uh, um, workflows and processes, we need to make certain that they're as streamlined as possible. What's the best way to do that? Get the people to the table who are doing the work. And we don't want to change a workflow and we don't want to change a process without the people who are doing the work and their input. Match the workload and the number of employees. Sometimes that's uh, hard to do. You know, if we have, uh, um, you know, high UHUs and we have more calls than we have employees, we got to figure out how to balance that for them. We got to make sure that we foster a work community of camaraderie and unity. Everybody works for the organization. Everybody is treated the same. We don't have bias in the organization, and we need to make sure everybody feels like they're part of that family. We invited these people into our organization to help us be successful. We need to make sure everybody feels like they're part of the family. Respect work-life work -life balance. Sometimes we just can't call those people in if we need them. Sure, we got to put the truck on the street, but that means maybe your supervisors have to run that call. And the managers have to come out and do the supervisor jobs. But let the people off and respect their work-life balance. Sometimes we know those people who will always come in and we call them first. 
but we have to be able to respect that they have home life. Next, empower your employees. Let them know that they have your, um, that you, th you know, thank them for the work that they do. Last couple slides. It's important that you develop a highly engaged workforce. You keep them engaged. Remove negative mindsets. This is really part of their development, right? They may have low self-esteem or low self-confidence. We have to be able to build them up. Always communicate. It's never, there's never too much communication. Be genuine as a leader. Inspire them. Motivate them. And then be a role model and mentor. Your job is to get the very best out of the workforce. They want what you have, right? They want to become FTOs. They want to become supervisors. They want to become managers and chiefs. How do you help them to do that? And mentorship and being a good role model is really important. Here's my final worry, ladies and gentlemen. You want the secret to good employee engagement? Treat your workforce like you would treat your patients, clients, and customers. That's it. You got to be able to treat them like they're your clients and customers and your patients. How would you do that? Your success. When you treat your workforce like they're that important, watch how they treat the people who are that important and you're going to see the difference. Oh, oh my gosh. How about that? Employee engagement. I know I talk fast and hopefully you got a lot of great things about it. I do want to let you know about my books. If you're interested uh, ultimate Leadership, 10 Rules for Success. These are the rules I had to develop to be a good leader. My leadership skills in the beginning were poor. They were horrible. I was a, a really bad leader, and I had to develop rules, right? Rule number one, never allow your emotions to dictate your actions. How do you think I came up with that rule? Because I allowed my emotions to dictate my actions. Ultimate Success, Strategic Leadership Excellence, those are the skills you need to have to be a successful leader. And one of the things we're doing is we're working on a course that's going to have uh, Ultimate Leadership. Uh, we're going to have that, uh, uh, you know, a, a four-hour course, an eight-hour course. Uh, we're going to base a, a whole development on that book. And if you want to reach me, this is my contact information. Uh, you can check out my website. I also host the Ultimate Leadership Podcast. Go ahead and join, become a fan, and I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and email me at chris at chrissabalero.com, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. And even if you want, I'll share the PowerPoint with you. But I want to thank you for the opportunity for uh, me to come and you to listen. I am very honored when you allow me to join you on your professional development journey. And I look forward to visiting with everyone again. Check out some of my other webinars that are coming up. And uh, if you have any things that I could work with you on, please don't hesitate to let me know. Thank you so much.